George Katz, very happy to see you on a Tech Explorations podcast. How are you today? Great. Thanks for having me on. Uh, hopefully, this will be an interesting conversation. Well, based on uh, a few things that we discussed already as we were warming up for this, uh, I think we are going to have a very interesting conversation. Um, well, before actually we get to the really, really cool stuff, let's talk a little bit about you and maybe you could give us an, an introduction. Uh, could you take a few minutes and tell us about yourself and um, what led you to where you are now? And actually, what do you do now? Okay. Um, so basically, ever since I can remember, I've been interested in making things. Uh, when I was young, I used to make things out of sort of paper, made paper models of all sorts of things. Uh, and then one day, mum and dad bought me this two transistor radio kit. Uh, it had springs to join wires together. And I put this together in about half an hour. And I thought, oh, this is great. You know, I can hear music out of just a few bits. And that's really what kicked me off in getting interested in electronics. Um, and I, so I persisted with that uh, through high school. We had a really good electronics teacher. Uh, so sort of my interest grew more and more. more. I steered more towards sort of the digital electronics. I was interested in computers, getting computers to do things at that time. And then uh, I ended up doing a computer engineering degree at University of New South Wales. Uh, and that was uh, also a great course because it sort of married both software and hardware um, sort of there was a, a gap that was identified within sort of the curriculum that that's something that should be taught um, and so in during that course I also became interested in robotics so I started building robots uh, both at home and I ended up building one for my thesis uh, and then when I finished my thesis uh, my supervisor actually um, contracted me to build them another robot for the AI department for other students so so that, that was kind of the best of both worlds. I was doing what I wa wanted to do. But the problem was there is, wasn't a lot of sort of work after uh, university to do with robotics or electronics. And sort of, so I steered more towards the software side of things as a software developer. Um, but electronics has always remained my hobby. So I continued that uh, just on my own time. But uh, probably about 13 years ago, uh, I saw an episode of Mythbusters and they were featuring a, a water rocket. And I thought, hmm, this looks pretty interesting. So I um, looked up online and there was all of these people building water rockets that were providing instructions on how to do that. And I, so I called up Dan and says, look, we've got to have a go. We've got to build one of these. And so the next day I went over to Dad's workshop and we built within three hours a launcher and we launched our first bottle rocket. And from that day on, we were hooked because of the sort of very simple construction, but the sort of performance you got out of this thing was, was quite impressive. Um, and from that point on, we just started building ever more complex rockets um, and pushing sort of uh, for higher performance. We were um, building multi-stage rockets. And that hasn't really stopped in the last 13 years. So we're now building some sort of really high-end rockets. Um, I, I see you're looking at the website. So it's something like the Dark Shadow, um, just in the index at the top. Um, Dark Shadow. Yeah, there you go. Did you pick uh, up the name? So this is one we just actually flew a few days ago again. Uh, this is a, a high pressure water rocket uh, and we ended up setting our new personal best altitude record with this one uh, at uh, 2,269 oh. feet. So this is your uh, life now? Uh, you are th a professional this pretty much has child. taken over the entire uh, household yeah. and, <laughs> and all of my f spare times used uh, taken up in, in water rockets. What, uh, like, what's the title that you go by? It's like a water rocket engineer? Oh uh, no! So uh, we've uh, our team's called Air Command Water Rockets. Um, so that that's what we fly the yeah. rockets under, and also what our website is. And what we try and do is we try and share all of the things that we learn, uh, as well as the failures, um, so that others can learn from that. Yeah. Uh, when we first started, it was uh, really important for us to be able to learn from others, and we thought we'd return some of that knowledge that we've gained over the years. Yeah, I, I was looking through your website and I noticed that you have full details of the builds. I think here Correct. you've got, uh, let, let's have a look at the shadow, for example. You've got day by day. Mm. 
mm -hmm. uh, what you do. I'll zoom in a little here. So this started the design on the 13th of July, then a you know, piece of V pipes, and then you show the workshop process. Is this mm -hmm. like your workshop, or do you go somewhere uh, to build things? That's right. So yeah. we, we, I've pretty much taken over the most of underneath the house in the garage and sort of a couple of workshops that we have there. Uh, but we use the website not only to inform other people, but it's kind of our logbook as well. So if yeah. we ever need to go back and see a particular technique, how we did something, we go back and refer to this material. It's your um, public record. It, it, that's exactly right. Um, so maybe um, go back a little bit to your university years. Uh, you mentioned that you, know, you, you were into robotics, that's what you wanted to do. and. Uh, mm -hmm. You loved robotics. Could you tell us a little bit about the robot that you built um, for your uh, supervisor or professor in university? Uh, so it was a, a mobile robot, so basically a, a mobile box. It was equipped with a couple of cameras, so that it was used for doing vision research for navigation. Mm -hmm. Um, and that it was really an open platform, so it had a PC at that time, um, so that the students could put on uh, any type of software that they wanted. Uh, but they didn't have to worry about the hardware, so I, I wrote uh, libraries for them to interface to to uh, allow them to control the cameras, the, the motion, the sensors, um, and then they would write the algorithms that they wanted uh, on top of that. It was that like um, based on a Raspberry Pi or something else? Like oh, PC? no, no. Was, was <laughs> this is way before, before the Raspberry right? Pi, yeah. So things were really um, hard back then. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, so the, the microcontroller there was uh, 68HC11 um, that controlled all the low-level stuff. Uh, and it was like, I think, a 486 at the time running right. the, the, the software on the robot. So sure. less, less powerful than the Raspberry Pi. Yeah, um, for those days. And the video must have been particularly like, challenging to make. Uh, to yeah, so we used it. like a... a I think it was called a video blaster at the time yeah. that could uh, digitize video. It was a specialist card, um, none of this USB type thing that you have these days. Um, yeah, and, and so we basically tried creating an, uh, an open platform for them to use. Um, How did that, so that was all over the years? Did it change once you left or? Um, um, I, th I think they used it for maybe two or three years after I had left and then by then other students were creating other robots yeah. and, and yeah. the lab itself had maybe a dozen different robots. It moved um, on. And then, um, yeah, technology changes really quickly, doesn't it? Like, uh, unless you're there to evolve um, your design with the latest in technology uh, or somebody else does it for you, it just goes away and something else will supersede it. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so for, for me, it was a good, fun project to work on, so what, I was happy. Uh, like, um, out of that project, what did you take with you uh, eventually? And perhaps uh, I wonder how much of that knowledge do you still use in your current projects, like some engineering principles, perhaps, uh, technology know-how, prototyping, like it could be very general as well. It doesn't need to be specific on the tech. Um, yeah, so, so it was basically uh, problems... Uh, the problem solving that's required to get the electronics to do what you want, um, you know, sensors fail and both today as they did back then. Um, so it was, uh, you know, how, how do you cope with the, the, the variances? And it was also the hardware limitation. So there were certain things you wanted to do, but the hardware just wasn't capable of doing that. So coming up with alternate ways or more optimal ways of using the, the existing hardware that you had. So the constraints uh, is, is a big, big part of engineering, no matter what you do. Exactly, exactly. Um, Constraint management, in a way. Uh, uh, one of the um, postgraduate students there and I built another robot, and this was for one of his projects. And that one was um, a floor cleaning robot but it used uh, an artificial nose to smell where it had already cleaned. So, so it, was, uh, it was quite an interesting one because you had to uh, add camphor to sort of the scrubbing brush. So it was for hardwood floors, not, yeah. not carpets. Uh, and it would lay down a scent of uh, camphor. And then uh, we got a, um, one of those, just a regular crystal without the can, and you could coat it with this special chemical that would um, absorb the camphor and change the frequency. And so, uh, so the, the, uh, the sensor was placed pretty close to the ground and then you had a, like a little extraction fan that could suck the air past it. So you could smell if it 
that there had been camphor or not and so it would know where the edge of the trail was where it would, was actually cleaning mm. and uh, I, I remember after we finished the the project and um, my friend was doing uh, sort of test runs and he would have to scrub the floor each time with alcohol to get rid of the camphor smell he says after like three hours he was ready to pass out from <laughs> just yeah, all of the smell. all of the fumes yeah. and, um, oh, it was really partially really successful, really but yeah, it was quite an interesting project. Yeah, uh, because I guess back then the constraint was that, you know, it, it wasn't, it wouldn't be, um, I guess, practical to remember the positions or the the path that the robot had taken. It, exactly. So you needed some kind of an absolute reference of where you had been yeah. and where you hadn't been. It'd literally um, leave a marker on the floor that would be invisible to the eye. Correct. At least correct. It wouldn't be a visible marker but it would perform the the job or the, the job of a marker mm -hmm. uh, very clever so that that constraint then made your colleague to think in a way out of the box and say okay let's use right right yeah, yeah it was marker. totally his idea it wasn't yeah. my idea i just helped him build the road right nice so then that take um, you move on to our uh, software engineering as a lot of other engineers have done like uh, you almost described my path, uh, in a way, I uh, got into teaching right after I finished my electrical engineering degree, uh, which involved a lot of software, uh, both teaching mm -hmm. and development. And it seems like that happened to you. What kind of software did you write? Um, so uh, I actually worked in this, uh, after I left uni, I worked at the Australian Museum for mm -hmm. about a year and a half doing interactive displays. Um, and so that was mostly d done in C and C++. Uh, and then I moved to the US uh, for about two and a half years. Um, and I did game development there for consoles yeah. like PlayStation and uh, oh. Sega Saturn at the time. Uh, and that was all pretty much C++ um, development. Then, when I came back from, from the US, that, that was around 98, um, I joined a company that did uh, military simulations. Mm -hmm. So training um, sailors how to do their jobs, how to operate equipment, and so we created simulations for them when they didn't have the equipment. Um, and again, most of that was done in C++. So probably the last 20 years, C++ had been my development. Um, it's so interesting. Uh uh, what do you think is C++ becoming more important as uh, you know, microcontrollers are obviously programmed in C++ uh, and they become more accessible to more people? It seems to me that it's a must-know language, uh, even if you start um, with Python. Uh, de definitely, although uh, I've kind of moved away, I'm doing a lot of online development now. Mm. So JavaScript has become probably in the last five years the predominant language I use. But obviously for specific you know, jo uh, jobs or projects, you have to just adapt to the language, whether it's Python, whether it's C++ or C or even Assembler, <laughs> although that's yeah. not that much these days. <laughs> yeah. um, so... Um, so you've got to be a yeah, I, I, I don't software. see C plus plus sort of sort of continuing to grow to grow in any particular way. I, I think things like um, Node JS as uh, smaller microcontrollers controllers become more powerful. Um, JavaScript is a much easier yeah. uh, language to use um, and develop in. Uh, but obviously, you know, there, there's specific languages for specific jobs. Yeah. Uh, so you got to be a polyglot, really, uh, even if you just program microcontrollers. So you dom even when your domain is fairly, not limited, but uh, I guess uh, um, uh, specific, your domain is like... Um, uh, uh, sorry, Peter, precise. I think you're dropping out. <laughs> uh, sorry, can you hear me? Ah, uh, yes, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, my internet connection is a bit unstable. So I was just saying, um, even if you're domain where you apply your project, where you work on your project is well defined, you still need to have skills in more than one programming languages to be able to be uh, effective. I uh, totally project, agree. Right? Yep. So um, that's the thing. Um, same thing goes with hardware, I guess, uh, which maybe we should get into that now. So uh, <laughs> let's, let's <laughs> talk about hardware for the next few minutes. 
So uh, eventually, you said about 13 years ago, uh, you mm -hmm. saw the Mythbusters episode about uh, uh, water what? rockets. Mm -hmm. uh, can you remember what is it that they were trying to debunk in that episode? What, what was uh, so, sorry, again, your, your internet okay. connection <laughs> dropped out. Can you repeat the last one? Yes, I'll go again. Uh, let me just close a couple of processes here that might be uh, taking up some bandwidth. Okay, so I was saying, um, so 13 years ago, you see a Mythbusters episode on TV. Uh, which mm -hmm. was about uh, water rockets. I wonder what was that episode about? Were they trying to debunk something? Uh, I think they were trying to launch a guy. So big water rockets <laughs> strapped to his <laughs> strapped to his back. Uh, there was some, I think, viral video that showed some guy getting launched a long way across the water, uh, and so they tried oh. replicating that oh, with, yes, with their has. dummy and kind of just flipped over and they had re referenced some other water rockets uh, at the time and so I thought oh this this looks pretty good so they used um, a, a buster for that I guess they didn't use one of the humans right <laughs> yeah for we buster, um, the, so um, we weren't quite ready to use a crush, human the crush dummy buster yeah <laughs> That's right. That's right. So, what was the verdict? Uh, was that kind of uh, it failed spectacularly. It failed. He just kind of flipped, uh, did a somersault, and uh, so it was nowhere near. So, uh, they basically came to the conclusion that that viral video was faked. That okay. there's no way that they could have Doctored. launched someone like that. Fake news. Uh, but that was enough <laughs> for you to uh, like get hooked into. Water uh, that's right. And, and really, what hooked us was that that launching that first bottle. Uh, by itself, just the amount of performance you got out of this thing that you know has been sitting in your fridge for the last couple of days <laughs> and, and a bit of compressed air and um, yeah, and that, that's really that's really what what hooked us in. Uh, well, okay, let's let's talk about then your first water rocket, which is probably the first water rocket for a lot of people, right? And uh, mm -hmm. I've, I've launched one of those. I think it was um, a Coke bottle. Yep, and we still continue to launch those ones to this day as well. Even single bottle ones, yeah. they're still great fun. Um, so, what, what's the principle behind a, a, a water rocket? A, a, like a simple water, I guess the principle is the same for all of them, but let's talk about uh, this one, AC1. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, th that's actually the photo of that very first launch. We launched it horizontally, we didn't want it <laughs> launching into the next door neighbor's yard. Of course, um, And so, the, the, the principle of water rockets is you're trying to um, expel a reactive mass in one direction so that the rocket flies in the other direction. Um, now, if you just used air, you can compress air that can store lots of energy, but because of its a low molecular weight, it doesn't have a lot of mass to throw in one direction, so the rocket doesn't perform as well. Um, so we use water uh, to provide that reactive mass, but you can't squeeze water, it's almost mm. incompressible, so you can't store a lot of energy in it. And so you kind of uh, find the balance between storing uh, energy in the air versus the amount of reactive mass that you can carry. And it, for water rockets, that turns out to be about a third full. So mm. of the capacity of the bottle, a third of it uh, needs to be water and two thirds air. And that gives kind of the optimal performance, regardless of the size of that water rocket. That percentage changes a little bit depending on what you're trying to do, um, what your nozzle size is, and what the sort of enclosure. Um, I guess whether it's a plastic bottle or maybe use other materials as well. Uh, yep. So ultimately, you're trying to squeeze the air as much as possible, but plastic bottles will burst at a certain pressure. Okay. So you can reinforce them uh, so that they can hold more pressure, but reinforcing them. Uh, gives you uh, introduces more weight, which affects the performance in a negative way. So it's always uh, this sort of balancing act. You, you're trying to manage um, probably six or seven different factors to get the most performance out of your rocket. Um, so a nozzle size affects how fast the rocket will fly. Um, but yeah. then if you try and fly too fast, you're inducing more drag, which also affects the rocket in a negative way. So yeah, the, it, it's and that's really what's r interested us all this time. It's that engineering challenge mm. of, you know, pushing materials to their limits to see what you can achieve with the. 
Is, so uh, just water in here. Uh, there's a lot of engineering in here, but I wonder, uh, like, uh, in terms of uh, the science behind it as well, is it possible to create formulas that you know you can plug in parameters of the, like the, have the capacity of a container, its uh, material, um, its uh, shape, absolutely, and, that and it there will tell you there, what, there are simulations that people have created um, that. Uh, most water rocketeers use to try and um, evaluate the performance of their rocket before they launch it. Uh, and the maths actually gets very complex behind water rockets. It doesn't seem like uh, it is, but because everything's changing as soon as you launch the rocket, the pressure's dropping, oh, the amount of water. System, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it's, um, it's, you sort of, it's not something you can just have a formula on hand that you, you could just fill in. Um, there's a guy called Dean Wheeler, um, many, many years ago, he was into water rockets and he's created a, a really detailed mathematics analysis of water rockets. Uh, and he created a, a very good simulator that we use to this day uh, that's very accurate, uh, predicts all the little subtle things that you see in the thrust curves. Um, and so, yeah, it's way above my head. <laughs> All the maths that goes uh, into this, but uh, I'm just happy to use the simulations. Um, I think I think I found uh, a reference here. That's the one. Yep. Uh, is using a flash plugin, so I won't be able to show you the simulation. But this is, this is the website, and uh, it's got a pump camera. Uh, if you if you have a look down physics and maths, and where it says thrust equations. Yeah. Uh, that one. And so there's a full paper, yeah, thrust <laughs> equations, not PDF. Yes. Well. Um, and very, very detailed analysis. So if anyone's interested in the mathematics behind, uh, this is definitely the go-to place to go. The um, science. Oh, wow, look at that. Uh, teachers, uh, pay attention here. <laughs> this is like, uh, yeah. what kid wouldn't like, love a lesson like this? Yeah. Hey, kids. Yeah. Well, well, like I said, the, the maths in this is way above by level. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, but uh, some, uh, there's complex, once you get down into it, there's very complex yeah. uh, equations. There you go. <laughs> no problem. But, but he, he does a really good thorough analysis of uh, how the air behaves when it cools. You're going to get condensate, air con condensating, which yeah. uses up some energy and sort of really, really um, detailed model. And as a result, his simulator does very good predictions of, of flights. Uh, yeah, we um, we we find probably within five percent of what we see in the real world is what his simulations so will very predict. precise. Yeah, uh, I wish those images would work here. The thrust curve. I think those are some broken links, but anyway, no problem. We get the idea. Um, so uh, back back to the picture here that we're looking at. So this is your first launch. There's the rocket mm -hmm. on its way to your pool, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. And then you've got uh, a launching pad, a horizontal launcher. Okay, yep. this device here, right? So yep. the bottle is resting at the top. Yep. And so what we use, we the nozzle was built out of a garden hose attachment, the thing that mm -hmm. goes onto your garden tap. Ah, uh, yes. And the right. release mechanism was the other end of a hose. So we fed the compressed air in through the garden hose. And then we just pulled back, once it was pressurized, we just pulled back on that collar to release the, the nozzle. Yeah. Um, and we continue to use that system to, to this day. It's very effective, very simple. So if you have a garden hose with that attachment that you use like for the, like the gardening um, pistol, I guess, I'm not sure how they call mm -hmm. that, uh, then you can apply it to, uh, to a water rocket and um, have a go horizontally, of course, if you're doing it in your backyard. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, so I guess things like the, the shape of the bottle as well, or aerodynamics, do those matter, at least in smaller rockets? Uh, yep, very important. Yeah. Um, so one of the, probably the most important things is to make sure that that rocket is stable, so it flies mm -hmm. like a dart or, a, or an arrow. Um, so you need some sort of fins and typically a nose weight on the front of the rocket. So the same way a dart uh, has... Uh, so these were some of the very early mm -hmm. uh, rockets where we made uh, ring fins at the bottom. Uh, so these had no parachutes. They just basically came down nose first and bounced. They had a soft nose cone. Um, so what kind of bottle is this? 
Oh, this is a two liter bottle. Uh, is it specialized or sp specially made no, to be a no, rocket? Or ju like just a regular, we, we, take, we cut another piece of a bottle for the nose cone. We glued yeah. that on, taped that on top. So this to improve the just, aerodynamics? Or does it do something um, else? Yep, that improves the aerodynamics and also helps uh, protect the bottle when it actually lands. So a rocket like this went uh, probably 250 feet mm. or so um, at you know, fairly low pressures, maybe 60, 70 psi. And, and uh, we, we were really lazy, so we used scuba tanks. Uh, both Dad and I are scuba, scuba divers, and right, so we had access to uh, lots of free air. So here's your scuba diving tank. Uh, you use mm -hmm. it to pressurize the bottle. So I guess yep. you just open up the, uh, the valve here. Yep, and so mm -hmm. that's a pressure regulator valve, so we can dial in what pressure we need. Okay, so you can be precise and can measure the optimal mm -hmm. pressure without breaking the bottle and you've got those metal rods on the sides just to keep it upright, upright that's exactly right so it doesn't yeah. fall over uh, we, we, we've had that happen where the sort of when before we had those you sort of pressurize start pressurizing it the whole thing would tip over then you'd run in all yeah. directions <laughs> because now you've got a <laughs> pressurized <laughs> rocket pointing at you so you learn through those things uh, yeah learn by mistakes is usually or learn the hard way is the best way uh, so yep. Never make the same mistake twice. Uh, and did, did you uh, put this rig together yourself? Is it like your yes. construction? Yes. So, so I guess part of the, the whole water rocket hobby is trying to make things sort of from everyday material. So whatever you come across, uh, that's kind of part of the challenge. Uh, but yeah, so with rocket development came also launcher development. So the launches improved over time. Um, Great. So this was uh, 2006, right? And then uh, yep. got to uh, AC3. What's, what's AC? Uh, Air Command. So this oh, was yeah. before we okay. started naming our rockets. This was kind of very, very, very yeah. early. Um, and then, yeah, so th this, this one used air brakes. We wanted to see what would happen if uh, you could open air brakes. Failed miserably, didn't what, work. What's an air brake? Uh, so it had these sort of plastic tabs that would open up after the rocket would tip over at Apogee. So instead of a parachute, these air brakes would deploy and slow That's the rocket right. down. Never worked. <laughs> so parachute still the best way to recover your vehicle? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. So this had a soft nose going, but uh, yeah, they s uh, slowly started to become sophisticated. Um, these ones that you're looking at, that was kind of a collection. We would just grab any old bottles and start trying everything. Now, one of, one of the things that's really important is you've got to use bottles for carbonated drinks, uh, ones for like still water. They're not meant, uh, designed to handle the pressure, so they'll blow it oh, at much I see, lower pressure. I see. Oh, that's a good clue. Yeah. Uh, again, we found that out the hard way. <laughs> so well, yeah, some of these of failed them. very early. So they're not the same bottles. So when you buy a bottle that contains just still water, uh, the plastic and the shape that the manufacturers uh, use is okay for uh, uh, non-pressurized drink. Correct, correct. If you have um, coke. So there, it's probably uh, either a cheaper plastic or thinner walls yeah. or huh. um, they can save a few, you know, half a cent on, on each bottle. That it's worth it to on. them. Yeah, there you go. No, I didn't realize that. So uh, I, I just want to uh, fast forward to your more yep. recent designs because then I also want to talk to you about your experience in Queensland where uh, you had uh, your you broke a new height record with one of your rockets so we'll get to that but let's mm -hmm. have a look at um, some of your so the, the, these ones started using so the next step was to try and uh, glue bottles together uh, that gives you more volume big, and therefore you can bigger, store right? more energy uh, yep so that that one was two bottled uh oh, no sorry yeah. that, that was the next one this was our first one that w where we put a camera on board so we had an onboard camera, camera. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that could record i think like 320 by 200 pixels for like 30 seconds that was the max but that was the lightest camera we could get so uh, so we uh, padded it so th what, what i'm looking at here is two bottles stuck together it seems yep. like the top part is like the payload it, it, that's exactly right. Yeah. So we've got the parachute on top, right. uh, then the payload really padded. We didn't want to destroy the camera. Yeah. Uh, and then a single bottle at the bottom. So uh, you, oh, you got, uh, how, how high did this rocket 
get to? Uh, this uh, could have been like 300 feet or so. 300 meters. So you got a good view out of the camera. Uh, 300 feet, so about 100 feet, meters. 100, okay. So you could see a bit past the neighborhood. We, we could see around the neighborhood. We could see the ocean, which we hadn't seen from that location before. So that, that was good fun. Well, uh, I have, uh, I've gone onto eBay and I found, I think they're called keychain cameras. So they, they look like this. Mm -hmm. Hang on, I'll, I'll just zoom in. Okay, there you go. So they look like this. I've put it in shrink wrapping and my uh -huh. plan is to wrap it or somehow I stick it onto my rocket when I come over and uh, launch it for the first time. And I got this for five bucks and it's a thing a 600 and 640, 640 by 480. It, it may actually be HD with audio, but it's okay. very light. It's got its own battery on it. Um, and you took the case off the yeah I removed it because the, it was a keychain it, it had like yep. a, a bracelet a bracelet uh, like for your cheek uh, a ring for your keychain I removed all that mm -hmm. <coughs> because it was also bulky and uh, not that, this is pretty much what we still use these yeah. kinds of cameras <laughs> so I'll uh, see how it works but it's amazing what you can get uh, these days when it comes to this technology. very cheap yep so you can attach that very here um, I'm going to point mine downwards because I want to see the fumes coming out of my rocket and uh, the ground <laughs> disappearing. <laughs> Best way to do it. Yeah. Best way to do it. So awesome. This is really nice. So then the other one you were talking about uh, where you connect two bottles to increase the capacity, would this one be one of them? Uh, we, I can't see oh, the screen. Let me uh, share my screen again. Yeah, so this was our very first one where we joined two bottles together. Um, so we had one on top to get more capacity. Yeah. Um, so I guess here you need to be very careful how you join them, right? You don't want leaks. Uh, that, that, that's the biggest challenge yeah. is uh, these were actually screwed together with a bolt with a hole in the middle, I think at about a five millimeter hole. Uh, not terribly effective, but it was better than a single bottle. Uh, this is what's known as a Robinson coupling. So a guy uh, many years ago developed these called Robinson couplings. So the technique uh, of how to do this. Uh, how to join bottles yeah. base to base. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that, that certainly helped with the performance. But the parachute on top was still relying on just falling off at apogee. So when, when the rocket slowed down enough, when it got to the maximum height, that top nose cone would just slip off and the parachute would fall out. How did you detect six that? It was, was it some kind of force it develops or N no that's the problem it was probably 60 percent effective right <laughs> so not not terribly reliable um, because um in the the few things i know about uh gunpowder type rockets um mm -hmm. the solid propellant solid, yep. yeah that's a term solid propellant is that they've got uh, a burner inside the engine that it's a timer essentially, and based on the yep. timer, it will ignite another small uh, ejection charge. Yep. Yeah, another small charge will will boost the parachute out, and that's yeah. how it's deployed. So it's time based. Where this one didn't have that feature. No, so, the, so th these were very basic, uh, and yeah, half the time they would crash, and so we'd have to rebuild. That's why you needed uh, to And so it was pr pretty soon after that, we thought, OK, well, we better put some kind of a timer on there. Yeah. And so having the electronics background, it was very easy to build a timer based, um, uh, a little electronic timer that activated a little servo motor that would then deploy the okay. parachute. And that, that's really from this point on is where we started using them. So then to make that reliable, you used a timer uh, that's um, so the timer would start counting down, uh, I guess, at launch? As soon as you launched. So you would arm it while it was on the pad uh, and the timer would detect launch. And typically it was either a G switch or a bit of a string, uh, uh, sorry, a bit of a spring on a contact. So as soon as it experienced acceleration, that spring would bend and make contact and start the timer. Uh, and then you would use the simulators uh, to predict how long it would take to get to Apogee oh. to give you that time and then you'd set your time based on that and if it's plus or minus a second or two it doesn't it's, okay. it's not critical but it will go it will be deployed 
Yep. Um, and here I'm looking at one of your <laughs> impressive designs. Uh, <laughs> Very early one, yeah, just uh, lots, lots of gaffer tape. <laughs> no, no, there was, this was pro proper, proper rocket engineering. That's a proper one. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got uh, lots of duct tape, you've got fins here to stabilize it. Yep. Yeah, so, so here the rockets are starting to become a bit more involved. Uh, we've got several uh, several bottles joined together now. Um, so you just use so the same technique or is there a different technique here? The same, te same technique and later on uh, th there's a different technique called splicing where you actually glue, the, you cut the bottoms off the bottles and you glue the bottles uh, together um, using a special glue and that's definitely a much more effective um, yeah. way to join them. You get much more performance out of it. Ooh. So this is the J4Y. J. And this was uh, John, my youngest son, had turned four years old, so we named this rocket after him. <laughs> so you've got all the specifications here. Yep. Uh, um, three bottles. So uh, as we went through different variants um, and tested different things, we would record how much it weighed and how much water it needed. and. Yeah. Um, the, the one on the left that you see, this was, uh, I think this was Graviton. See the colored parts of the payload? Uh, those were actually M&Ms and we were trying to see what M&Ms do in microgravity. <laughs> so when you shot this, we had a camera at the top looking down at the M&Ms. And so when the rocket would um, slow down near Apogee, everything is essentially in zero G. And so you'd see these M&Ms floating around <laughs> inside the rocket. Um, and and th that was one of the things we, we've always enjoyed is putting in sort of interesting payloads and seeing how things behave. Yeah. And a lot of the time things might be counterintuitive to what you might think should be happening on a rocket. Um, people will design deployment mechanisms thinking that if the rocket tips over because gravity points a particular way, um, they can activate a mechanism. But pretty much after the rocket burns out, you're in negative G all the way to the ground, you never notice that Three, you pass four. through Apogee. That's right, yeah. Yep. Uh, and, and so uh, some of the experiments we do um, explain that uh, to people, you know, how they behave, that you can't rely on that. So but I guess if you install some sensors, you'll be able to, to even in real time, see how your rocket is doing and what kind of forces mm -hmm. uh, apply on, on the rocket. and. Um, and analyze it that way. You just analyze the data instead of... Um, yep, yeah, so you can fly position. accelerometers on it, barometers, uh, barometric sensors, um, yeah, magnetometers, so that it mm. tells you which direction, uh, it's how the rocket is spinning in relation to the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, there have been even apogee detectors developed. They're called uh, magnetic apogee detectors. And when the rocket launches, it'll sense the direction of the Earth's magnetic field. Mm. And when the rocket tips over at Apogee, it senses the reversal of that field and can open the parachute. Right, you, because you can't use the G-forces. You can't use um, like mechanical forces to detect the movement. Correct, correct. correct. So you need to use um, magnetism then, and uh, a compass would help you in that. This is very interesting. So that's, um, that's how, like, you can use engineering to show to, like, say, young students, but uh, people in general, how our senses, how we expect things might work out, don't because we are exactly. just not familiar with the with the the, the context of um, a, a rocket that is in flight. Mm -hmm. We just have no experience. And so a, a typical sensor would be like a mercury switch. So people will mount a mercury switch inside of their rocket thinking when, when it yeah. tips over, we're going to see that mercury move. And one of the uh, experiment payloads we flew were uh, mercury switches and we had a detailed camera showing the behavior of those switches in relation to the rest of the flight, how they activate very soon after burnout and don't activate at Apogee. And um, so it was quite interesting to see how, how those behave. Um, and hopefully it educates people not to uh, follow that path. Um, yeah, follow the data, not your intuition hmm. when it comes to uh, yep. science and engineering. Uh, there's another little detail here, a dual mm -hmm. parachute deploy mechanism. So we had a little parachute that pulled out a much bigger parachute, so we didn't need to have a, um, a, a, a massive mechanism to get a big parachute out. You just pulled out a little 
So um, primary is pilot the one, tune, yep. right? And the secondary yep. is the big one. Yeah, and yeah. all all it had was the uh, the string running behind the the big parachute. Yeah, so the, when the soon as the small one would open, it would provide enough force to pull the big one out. So it just that. pulls it out. If right yep. the, the yep. blue string behind the secondary parachute, it just pulls it out. Pulled it out. Yeah. yeah. So so you're always trying to look for you know the simplest ways of achieving things, yeah. which tend to be more reliable. String. Uh, not always, but. Oh. Practice makes perfect. And um, yeah, so from this point on, we've really been using uh, electronic timers um, for, for getting our parachutes. Oh so, yeah, look at that. This is, uh, so you're getting very sophisticated here. Yeah. And yeah. So this one had boosters on the side, so it would help get the rocket up to speed. Uh, Are these and like then the main independent uh, Right, so th those would fall off uh, when they've spent their um, their energy, they would just, um, the, basically you had these tubes on the main rocket and these pins pointing up uh, in the boosters. And because the boosters produced more thrust than the main stage, uh, when you launch the whole thing, the boosters would keep themselves in place and then as soon as they stopped producing thrust, they would just slide out, out right. of the tubes well, so at, at the most <laughs> optimal time. Um, yeah, so and, as a, yeah. Go ahead. So you uh, like that, um, uh, that uh, how would you call it like um, attachment mechanism means that you don't need to worry about any complicated um, mechanisms to separate the side boosters from the main body. Just exactly, you didn't need to have sensors when yeah. they stop producing thrust. It's kind of all self-regulating. So, and if one booster was producing slightly more thrust than another, then it would. Uh, drop off slightly later. Um, so as soon as it, it was done doing what it needed to do, it would fall off by itself. And um, in, in terms of directionality, you just need to be, I guess, very careful and precise with the pressure inside the bottles so that it eventually would go straight up instead of moving to the side. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> you can't really control we, we, we've had all, all sorts of failures. We went through that. Um, all of the... Uh, uh, boosters are uh, connected to to the same manifold, so they all end up with the same pressure. Uh, we found early if we didn't if we just connected the nozzles directly, if one booster got slightly more air in it, it would start transferring the water through the manifold into the other boosters, mm. uh, and so we had to end up solving that problem by running tubes up through the nozzles above the water, so the pressures could equalize themselves, but the water wasn't transferred. A again, you, you don't discover that until you actually build it. And then yeah, uh, so true. Like you've got to try these things. That's where like, a, a lot in engineering is like theory and practice are two different things. And um, mm -hmm. you may have a great idea about something, but until you actually do it, you just don't really know if it's a reasonable one. Uh, I've solved a lot of problems, theoretically. <laughs> 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 and uh, trying then to when it comes it. to practice, yeah, there's uh, <laughs> totally. uh, other factors will often crop up. Yeah, that, totally uh, totally. we've blown up a few rockets, uh, quite a few rockets actually, um, just exceeded the um, the tachyon. It sounds like a Star Trek reference. <laughs> yeah, so so we actually based a lot of the names of our rockets on subatomic particles. <laughs> we needed some kind of a unique name, so that that's what we we ended up going so, with. Are these your designs? Yes. So you uh, although they're, they're very similar to what other water rocketeers uh, have done. So there's a lot of cross-pollination of ideas about how, how things are done. The Robinson couplings weren't, weren't our ideas. The, uh, the uh, garden hose nozzles weren't our ideas. Mm. Uh, but what we've always tried doing was uh, building modular rockets. So if we damage a part of it, you can just unscrew oh, yeah. it, put another bit on. And, you've got um, the electronics up here, so you've got a flight computer. Hmm. Yep. So what's in here? Uh, so this was basically uh, measuring, that was a timer, but it was also programmable. So you could program server motor positions where the motor starts and ends. Um, and it was also going to be doing uh, barometric logging. Mm -hmm. uh, although this particular one, we never ended up doing that. Um, that would come later. Are, um, are their flight computers designed for water rockets particularly or? Um, that, that's a really good question. There are um, 
lots and lots of flight computers for uh, model rockets. Yeah. And recently I've seen some adaptations of those for water rockets to try and sense um, when the rocket launches uh, and it's got a different set of criteria for detecting because water rockets can uh, sometimes lift off fairly slowly depending on mm. what kind of rocket you're doing. So they've been modified with water rockets in mind, but typically you can use most model rocket flight computers, yeah. commercial ones in, on water rockets as well. Okay, uh, and so altimeters now we exclusively buy commercial ones. There's, you can develop your own. There are, you know, Spark Fun will sell you uh, barometric sensors that are easy to connect to an Arduino yeah, yeah, yeah. type those, thing. Yeah. But you'd need to calibrate it. It's much easier to just buy a commercial one uh, that's already calibrated, designed for the job. Yeah, just to begin with, uh, because I'm very interested, like with my rocket, I'm looking around for uh, data. I, like, I really want to uh, to measure what's going on in the rocket during its flight and then to be able to visualize it and get the kids to have a look at it and you know, uh, analyze what's happening here, what's happening there. Mm -hmm. So uh, that would be the first step. Uh, so I'd be very interested in, in a off-the-shelf um, flight computer. And I know that mm -hmm. because I've been playing around with quadcopters and drones in general, those are very common devices and easy devices and, and cheap. Mm -hmm. right? But um, it's a different story when it comes to rocketry. Because of the difference. Right, the and, and so it de depends on the sort of hardware that you get uh, depends on the p performance of your rocket. So if you've got a really high acceleration rocket and you want to measure acceleration, you'll need uh, a flight computer with the right kinds of sensors that might yeah. be able to sense up to, yeah. you know, 50 G, um, whereas some of the cheaper <laughs> ones might be 20 G or um, have limits. Yeah. Um, so, so you'd saturate those sensors. Exactly. So the, there's the differences, uh, just the G forces mm -hmm. are some different yeah. accelerations. Um, and a lot of the times, these, uh, if you're going, going supersonic, um, a lot of them will have uh, be able to deal with the shock waves um, as they sort of move down the rocket as you go transonic. Uh, that can affect some uh, some sensors as well. So they have filters to specifically filter hmm. that out. Yes, another thing I hadn't realized is that these rockets, especially the uh, solid uh, boosters uh, ones, can go supersonic. Mm -hmm. Well, when we are playing around with drones, that like it's like too far to worry about. Like it's not a yeah, yeah, yeah. Not even when it crashes, it won't go supersonic. <laughs> All right. Well, I've got um, yeah. I can see your tutorials here. You've got a beginner stuff, <laughs> all the way to like yeah, quite elaborate and advanced uh, tutorials. So I encourage anyone to have a look at those and uh, you know, start tinkering with water rockets. Um, I'd like to ask you now about your uh, um, weekend, last weekend in... Uh, sure. Actually week, sure. it was a whole week. <laughs> a whole right. week, yeah. Tell us what happened. Um, so uh, the um, events organized by Australian Rocketry, uh, it's a Queensland uh, rocketry group, um, and it was a big international event. So the last time this happened was uh, about four years ago. Um, and it's, you get people from all over the world. There was uh, New Zealand and Japan, people from America, Germany, Netherlands, uh, and then a whole bunch of people from Australia. Uh, and this time it was also combined with Australian um, University Rocketry Challenge. So there was a group, I think of about eight, uh, maybe 10 universities uh, that had certain challenges that they, they um, this, yeah, this was the one four years ago. Uh, and yeah. um, and uh, they had like a 10,000 foot challenge. So who can get closest to 10,000 feet? They also had a 30,000 foot challenge. So up to uh, 10 kilometers that to fly rockets. So these are big, big, big rockets. Um, and yeah, it's basically four days in a paddock uh, flying rockets. Um, they had uh, other events. They had some parachutists come in and, and fly. That there was some acrobatics happening as well, fireworks. So it was a big event, um, all centered around doing stuff in the sky. But yeah, certainly rockets were the the predominant uh, feature. So um, you there had, was some. You had one, right? Sorry. 
did you have a, a rocket as well that you uh, yeah we, we brought a whole bunch of rockets um <laughs> we, we brought our water rockets um and that was the dark shadow one uh we're also working on a a high pressure two-stage water rocket uh, at the moment and so we only brought a part of it we hadn't finished it in time um to test that but we had a failure so um we've learned from that one uh but uh, yeah I'm just yeah, going it, it, to it, a new one. Uh, it looks like there's some issue with the uh, security certificate. <laughs> oh, I think, yeah, it just expired on their site a couple of days ago. I, I think I can still get to it. Uh, so, uh, so the event is organized in way inland queensland yeah it's about five hours west right. of brisbane just open farmland yeah. well away from many cities oh, uh, roads <laughs> <Somebody there. laughs> and people yeah so uh, that's what it looks like um i wonder uh, you'll be putting some footage like photos and videos photos yeah website. people have already started putting putting it up uh, uh, and what, what was really impressive was the the entries by the university students i mean really professional um uh put together rockets uh really outstanding effort on on their part uh they were flying some really interesting payloads on some of them um uh, there was one group that flew like a ferromagnetic liquid and they were seeing what happens in microgravity and i think that there's going to be a research paper based on on the uh, data that they collected on that one uh there was some there was a two-stage flight i believe to around fifty thousand feet fifty uh, did you say 15 or fi five zero five zero 50, yeah 50,000 oh. um so i guess you need do you need some permit from the government or uh yeah so you have to have clearance <laughs> by um you have to have clearance by casa you have to yeah. have insurance and fire department and council and landowner there's, there's lots and lots of behind the scenes paperwork that has to happen yeah. to to get these events yeah. um and uh, because we get air clearance, aircraft get diverted from that area um, to make sure yeah, that they're not flying 000, through that airspace. It is where commercial airliners fly. Okay, it's, it's yeah. above that level. Yeah, it's almost double the, the altitude. So you could just uh, go through. Four, four, year, four years ago, there was one guy, uh, Nick Lottering, he flew uh, his rocket uh, to, I believe, 66,000 feet uh, at about Mark 3.5 or so. So very serious rockets uh, get flown at these events so they, and that's why it's worthwhile going to them now the edge of space is a hundred thousand feet uh three hundred thousand three hundred thousand so, so, oh. so not not quite there um okay. but getting close for just a, a guy building rockets in his uh garage that's pretty yeah. good it's not just elon musk uh, <laughs> other people up and coming including australia yeah. here but for things like that you do need large open spaces for your yes. prototypes um, and, uh, uh, and Australia is a great place to do that yeah uh, so there's uh, like what I take from this event is that there's uh, a lot of uh, a lot of noise <laughs> you know, from uh, these solid uh, engines I, I, um, you're well away from them so as the rockets get bigger they get put further and further away from the yeah. crowd um, so some of the biggest ones you're looking at you know three four five hundred meters away um so yeah. the noise isn't as bad um, oh, okay but there's uh, there's a lot of science being done because it's an opportunity for as you said university groups and teams uh, mm -hmm. to conduct some research that you just can't do in your park on the mm -hmm. weekend you you need uh some like an opportunity to launch your um ferromagnetic experiments <laughs> into <laughs> suborbit <laughs> so that's an opportunity yeah. there uh, yeah I, I think they were saying they had about 30 seconds of microgravity to yeah. in which they could do the experiment yeah. but the, these rockets are sort of at, at this end sort of at the very limit of what people are capable of building they're you know having to think about uh the aerodynamic heating from supersonic flights and you know quarter of the time these rockets will sh rip themselves apart mm. um, simply because they're just going too fast uh, and so it's it's a real challenge to to get these things to fly properly um, but that's where part of the fun is that's the fun is exactly yeah. well 
another like another thing that I really want to talk to you about and looking at the time now we are about to hit an hour but uh, I want to ask you about uh, rocketry clubs and mm -hmm. um, like I know that you are involved with the rocketry club and that is uh, a club that can help people who are interested in rockets Absolutely. Uh, to get into um, is it a hobby is it a sport I'm not sure <laughs> but into <laughs> rocketry both, both. <laughs> both yeah, yeah. So could yeah. you tell us a bit about uh, so, it? So for pe people that are interested in, in flying rockets, it's the b best idea is to join uh, your local club. Um, we fly with New South Wales Rocketry Association. Uh, and there they'll provide you with uh, airspace where you can fly your rockets. Um, uh, you're not limited to just your 400 feet like you are in a local park. 400, you uh, said, 400 feet? 400 feet, yeah, so about 120 metres. Same yeah. like drones. Uh, drone limits. Yep. Um, so uh, yeah, the club will have uh, altitude um, limits depending on the, uh, the site, mm -hmm. uh, but you also get launch equipment, but most of all you get the knowledge, the collective knowledge of all the members yep. that have been flying for many years. So if you have a particular issue, there's always someone there to discuss it and m most likely they'll have some kind of a solution for you. Um, so uh, yeah, de definitely. That's coming days, up right? in a yeah. couple of days. Yep. You got one coming uh, up. So this is your club. This is our club. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, another nice thing I think that happens through these clubs is that you have the insurances as well. Insurance, right. you're covered so by insurance. Club. That's right. Uh, you have landowners' permission. We've got council permission to la launch here. Yeah. Um, so really all of your launching needs are taken care of. You just have to bring your rocket and your motors and um, and then you've got the safe area to do yeah. it in. Um, so I've got, uh, so people like uh, myself, I'm a totally beginner. Actually, I've never launched my first rocket, but I do have one, it's in a box. Um, I'm going to put it together soon. So here, here's my rocket. <laughs> yeah, uh, and that, that's the perfect way to start is yeah. you build a few uh, kit rockets and then uh, you can move on to building your own scratch built rockets or modifying the kits for, for specific needs. It's um, very, yeah, um, great for kids. It's very because, addictive. <laughs> yeah, uh, kids are very excited to wake up in the morning and, and go. Um, and, you know, learning about um, the engines. And uh, mm -hmm. when I first heard the term engine for a rocket, I thought, wow, this is pretty sophisticated, but then I realized it's mm -hmm. essentially gunpowder mm -hmm. in a container, and that's called an engine, but uh, it is it is sophisticated because it, is, it does have the timer that we were talking about earlier in here that's to right. launch the, that's right. the um, uh, parachute. So there's a lot of learning to be done, but a lot of fun mm -hmm. as well, and I think they're having a few sensors on board and a video camera to document your launch and save it forever. Mm -hmm that uh, that's, uh, makes it uh, like a very exciting event for the family. So uh, yeah, I try to, yeah. Um, probably Saturday won't be possible, but uh, May for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, eventually we all stop using our kids as, a, as an excuse for, <laughs> for going to a launch and we just launch them. Okay. <laughs> they, <laughs> they're great for retrieving <laughs> rockets. Yeah, they do run around like crazy. <laughs> I think actually that's what they're waiting for. They're waiting for the... Uh, <laughs> rocket to come down so they can run to it and see what's left. Well, okay. Well, um, let's wrap it up, George. Um, what kind of resources would you recommend to somebody to look at, whether web, books, um, videos, to somebody who's interested either in, rocket, in rocketry in general, but in particular perhaps in uh, water rockets? Um, um, just a good way to begin. Uh, Starting off simple, uh, so getting up a launcher that um, can launch your rocket safely um, and starting off with a single bottle. Best way is to go on Google and look for water rockets tutorial. There's hundreds and hundreds of examples of how people, like, uh, <laughs> like mine exactly, uh, we're just one of you know hundreds of people that, yeah. that put up uh, instructions. Um, so th that's the best way you start off simple. Eventually you're going to realize you need to go to the fridge and look for bigger bottles because you want to go higher. Uh, and then you, uh, when, when you're done using those, you'll go to the supermarket, look for aerodynamic bottles. You never look at a bottle again the same way. Uh, 
and then uh, you start joining bottles together. You, you realize that now the rockets are too big to come down with a soft nose cone. You need a parachute to yeah. develop your parachute mechanism. But starting off simple uh, and you get great performance out of even just simple rockets, um, you know, keep you entertained for years uh, before you need to get more sophisticated. Um, so, so yeah, so just go Google's your friend. Um, yeah. And, and if I understand right, you've got to be prepared to be hands-on, like uh, it's not something that you read and learn. Like yeah, that. yeah, no, yeah. It, it's totally hands-on. And like I said, that first bottle that you launch, you'll be hooked. Yeah. Very addictive. Great. Um, and uh, I think uh, you have a YouTube channel as well? I do. Uh, Here it is. So we'll, we'll be posting some videos from the latest launch yeah. up in Queensland. Um, So uh, that video running there was uh, was the the rocket we actually launched again. Uh, this one, uh, it's a high performing one. Five hundred meters. Yeah. And so, it's water. so this doesn't look plastic, is it? Is it? No. So this is all made out of carbon fiber. So yeah. this is kind of at the the high end of water rocketry. Um, we run an electronic payload with altimeters and and timers and. Is this footage from the actual? Yep, yeah, that's the footage from the rocket. Uh, Look at that. It's a long way up. It's better if you rewind it just a little bit where you see the takeoff <laughs> rather than... Yeah, yeah. Too, too much. Forward, forward, forward. A bit more. A bit more. Yeah, just there. Um, oh, look at that. The water is starting to sprinkle. Yeah. So th this is the onboard footage. <laughs> wow, look at that. Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. What kind of camera did you use up there? Uh, like what what you had mix. in your hand. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Just a keychain $5. camera. The, yeah. the, the, they're light, they're destructible. If you destroy it, yeah. no big deal. It's okay. um, they're they're perfectly suitable for the, the job. The SD card is going to pop out, so I'll be using tape around it. Yep, put tape on it. Awesome. Um, okay. Well, thank you very much for this, George. It's been uh, a real, really uh, good conversation. I really enjoyed it. Um, Thanks for having me on. Uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, and, uh, anytime I get to talk about rockets, that's yeah, good. I get the feeling that you enjoyed it too. <laughs> so you've got all your contact details here. So if people want to uh, get in touch with you. Yeah, e e email's the mm -hmm. best way. Yeah. Um, like it says there, I, I'll always respond to emails, but it might take me a couple of days. Um, I tend to answer them in in batches every few days. We well, have um, to go out to launch rockets. So gotta yeah, got to build rockets and, 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 and launch them. Great. Well, uh, I'll see you at the next launch. Look forward to it. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay, Peter. See ya. Great. Thank you, George. I just stopped these recordings. Uh, cool.